We welcome you to today's uh, unit record report uh, training webinar. Uh, this is the second of our presentations. With me today is Stephanie Casino, who is um, with the um, State Board of Community and Technical and, uh, Colleges as the Senior Functional Analyst uh, with the CTC Link PeopleSoft uh, program. Stephanie, would you like to say hello? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, also with me is Marla Skelly, who is our Associate Director for Compliance at WASAC. Good afternoon, everybody. And my name is Ann Boyles. Uh, before we get started into the main body of our presentation, I'd like to just cover a couple of um, minor housekeeping issues. Uh, first of all, um, the audience is muted at this time. Uh, we have the Q&A box open and available for you. You should be able to um, both enter information and respond as well. So uh, feel free if you have any questions about our material uh, to enter your questions there in the Q&A box. The chat should be disabled. So please don't use um, that functionality. Uh, I, I believe that it, it will not uh, show up on our end. Um, but in the meantime, um, please include your, your questions there in the Q&A, and we will be monitoring that to uh, attempt to provide you with information and answers to those questions as we go. We may occasionally uh, stop to unmute. Uh, I know at the very end of this session, um, that is our, our uh, goal is to unmute and uh, allow for some live uh, discussion, if at all possible. The other uh, piece of information I want to share before we get started is that we will be um, posting this particular video. It is being recorded uh, to our uh, WASAC website, hopefully within the next week. So uh, we will notify you once that information is available to you on the website. Uh, Marla, would you like to go ahead and take over? Hello, everyone. Um I just want to say that we do this every year, as you know, and it's there's really a lot of information in this presentation. And I want to encourage all of you to take a look at the unit record manual. Everything I'm going to talk about and everything that Anne is going to demonstrate is in the manual. So if you hit a bump, or you have a question, it's really a good resource for you. And since all of it's there, I'm not, I'm going to try and go through the presentation a little more quickly. Uh, but who knows if that will happen? Um, stuff comes up, and I know that this is important information for you. And I can't even believe it's starting again. So, what is the purpose of the unit record report? This is, if believe it or not, the 54th year of the unit record. In the beginning, we were, uh, it was created for the state need grant program, which is morphed into the Washington College grant program. And it's to record all of the need-based, state need-based aid that your institutions award and spend. What it allows us to get to is institutional comparisons across the state. So we can compare information by sector, by institution, um, which really gives us a lot of information that we need. It measures the needs of our students. What is missing? Uh, we rely on this data for advocating on behalf of students to the legislature and other external communities. We use it also to look at unmet need. And this year in the unit record, and I'll get to that in a little bit, we use the unit record to try and identify those areas of unmet need. Why is there unmet need? Are, are we doing a good job? It informs potential changes to state aid programs through modeling any proposed changes. The update of Washington College grant as, um, 
a program where we have no unserved students was really created through modeling what was going on in the state and how much money we needed to continue the program and serve 100% MFI students. It also, more importantly, at least from our perspective, it provides a central data repository. So we can go out and identify reports that help the institutions, our external agencies and legislative staff to really understand what's going on with state financial aid. It minimizes ad hoc data requests that you all need to provide. And I think that's a good thing. So what's the timeline? The unit record manual is available now at wasac.wa.gov backslash unit dash record. And the unit record training portal is available. A uh, training website is available for file testing and practice of the unit record features. We encourage you to test so the upload and all of the functionality so you're familiar with it. It opened yesterday, so uh, the application is ready for you, although Stephanie will probably talk about that a little bit for the community colleges. The finalized report due is October 9th, and every year we stress how important this deadline is. Anne and I spend virtually all of October, November, December, and this year we actually had to go into January for the analysis of the data. That put us really behind the eight ball because we didn't have reports that the legislature needed this last session. We hope to have reports to policymakers in December. And then in January, sometime when everything's finalized, we have the institutional profiles available to the institutions. So the manual layout basically is the introduction, and in my opinion, probably the most important part of the manual. This outlines the overview, the purpose, changes, the timeline, uh, and especially for those changes that occurred that you might not be as familiar with. And then the first three chapters are general instructions, data definitions, reporting applications, user's guide. This gives you virtually everything you need. The data definitions is particularly helpful in my opinion. And then the last piece is the appendices. There are five appendices. Uh, A is this need-based and non-need-based program recipients to report. It identifies who should be reported. B is the record layout, which the file format and valid inputs are listed. C is system edits that prevent file upload and import, which is particularly important because if you have any of those, it will stop your upload. D is a quick lookup by financial aid program, basically telling you um, if it's need-based or not need-based. And then E is a quick lookup by unit record report field name. So the CSV file, should include only students who receive financial aid based on the 22-23 FAFSA or WASFA year. And I always forget this, um, but there are a number of new people in the room and WASFA stands for the Washington Application for State Financial Aid. So we call it WASFA and forget what the acronym really is. So there it is for you. Report files, in the updated CSV lay, layout format with a header row. If it doesn't have a header row, it won't load. And then more importantly, review the field definitions in chapter two of the manual and re record layout in appendices B and C to determine your valid input. There is a sample CSV on our website and keep in mind that there is significant change for the 2223 unit record. Who should you report? 
we're looking initially for need-based recipients, that those students who have filed the 22-23 FAFSA or WASFA, and in order to receive those funds, the FAFSA and WASFA are required. Need-based aid recipients or other programs where the FAFSA or WASPA may or may not be available. And then non-need-based federal loan recipients are, need, are required to be reported. And those are the federal direct unsubsidized loans, federal parent loans, and federal grad plus loans. So, <laughs> The intention of this report is to capture all financial aid disbursements in a unit record report, and that's a lot of data. So report this year, all financial aid received based on the filing of the 22-23 FAFSA or WASFA. And the next year, of course, it's going to be on the 23-24 FAFSA or WASFA. Stephanie? Thank you, Marla. And I'll touch on this a couple times throughout the presentation. Um, the URR manual for CTC Link is available and up to date out on the Reference Center. And um, currently, you can run the unit record report, but please don't load it to the WASAC portal yet as it doesn't have the two new file headers. So, in order to create your CSV file, you'll go out to our state FA reporting component and you'll enter your institution and a year. You'll enter your designated file path. The re report type will be blank and you'll select run. Within a process scheduler request, you will select unit record report, click OK. And once the process runs to success and posted, you'll have your PSB report that's been generated with header rows. And this includes those who've received awards for 22-23 aid year. The unit record report selects need-based recipients and non-need-based federal loan recipients. And we'll see in an upcoming slide that WAVE has returned and that must be reported on unit record. And WASAC has stated that while WAVE is considered non-need-based aid, it must be reported even if that's only the only award the student receives for that aid year. So we have configured our unit record report to do that. Thanks, Stephanie. This slide identifies those need-based uh, recipient awards that are required, and the FAFSA is required for these. One thing I want to emphasize for this is if you do a professional judgment or special condition, you really need to make sure you resubmit the FAFSA so that you're working off the most current data. But you can read through these as, as uh, these funds as well as I, uh, and the asterisk basically identifies those funds that require the FAFSA or WASFA, um, and then you've got the state work study on and off where the FAFSA or WASFA is required. Keep in mind, DACA students must have a valid work authorization for this particular fund. Need-based other programs. Again, you can work through this. The WASOs, uh, as a caution, just know there's there's the WASOs Career Tech, WASOs Grad, and the WASOs BA Scholarship, which was formerly the Opportunity Scholarship. Federal non-need-based loans, as I said earlier, the Direct Unsub, Parent Plus, and Grad Plus loan. It may be that students, the only aid that they may have is one of these loans, but we want you to report these students. BFET are a subset of worker retraining funds. If your college receives these funds, we want you to report them under worker retraining funds. We're, uh, report them if you can.
And in CTC Link, we have some global setup for unit record that is maintained by state board. And this global setup includes the ethnicity, ethnicity categories, those so seven ethnicity categories, along with award categories that are tied to those file headers and the file laid out. And within these award categories, we have need-based, FAFSA, WASPA data required or optional, non-need-based loans or other, and the award maximum amount. We also have some institution-based configuration that each college will maintain. We have URR ethnicity category that's linked to PeopleSoft ethnic group value. And I do want to mention, typically when a college is deployed, we have configured all the available ethnicity category to ethnic group mapping. And then going forward, each year we would ask you to take a look and make sure there's not a discrepancy between what's in your table and what exists in that lookup tool. Well, last fall, there was an update from data governance which implemented an additional 256 ethnic background codes that were added to the system. We assumed you all didn't want to manually go in and add those, so we've uploaded those new categories into each institution setup on their behalf. So those have been updated. We highly encourage you to review what is in your ethnicity setup table versus what's in that CTC link you are manual. And then the other piece of institutional configuration would be your award category mapping to the FA item type and award status of offered, accepted, or dispersed. So there are some changes for the 22-23 unit record report. Uh, we've added some new fields to the CSV header fi file record layout. Those would be the WCG bridge grant and WAVE, as Stephanie indicated earlier, that was reinstated during the 22-23 academic year. We also have some functional improvements, uh, and there are up updates to the overrides generally, but I'm going to talk about two. Uh, the ability for uh, the original writer to amend or edit their own override comments instead of deleting and adding a new comment. However, you cannot edit someone else's override comments. That's a safety uh, for the person who created the initial edit. And the ability to view previously addressed overrides in errors screen that have been resolved. Errors that were corrected before entering an override comment will disappear from the list as before. We do have some new error codes, one that is important and will affect how you process your unit record errors. In, there's informational errors that should be reviewed and corrected if needed. Those of you who did complete the unit record last year notice that there is this bulk override capability. On these, on these informational errors, we don't want you to bulk override that error. Uh, the two informational errors I'm, that I'm talking about are enrollment does not match need duration, and the total need-based aid exceeds the report needed amount. The Second bullet in this uh, category, basically, we have been struggling over the years to identify potential override situations. This particular informational override will help us do that. In the past, Anne and I have gone through the cost of attendance screen and really eyeballed to see, oh, is there a potential issue here? Is there enrollment not matching? Those kinds of things. And that's we just look at that and if it looks funny, we let you know it looks funny and you need to respond to us. We think that these two informational errors will really help identify those things so there's not so much guessing on our part. 
The WCG Bridge recipient, if they're not a state resident, you will get those, those need to be corrected. And you can refer to pages three and four in the manual for additional details on this. For the 23-24 unit record report portal, the changes that we do know about, the Washington College Grant Connect and Nurses Conditional Scholarship programs are expected to be separately reported fields in 23-24. The Washington College Grant Apprenticeship, WCG-A, may become URR reportable in the 24-25 or 25-26 years. That's just questionable. As soon as we know, you'll know. Potential for addi the addition of new state-funded aid programs that might be enacted by the legislature could affect the 23-24 unit record. Specific details will be announced as soon as we have information on that. For all financial aid recipients, the reporting requirements are that you report financial aid for each of the five terms. But that means financial aid for those terms that they're actually there. You need to report enrollment status for each of the five terms. Report non-need-based aid received for all need-based recipients. The required fields are listed here. The social security number tends to be one of the most important. The rejected ICER we'll talk about in a little bit. The CSV file requires a header row, and we've talked about that a little bit already. The revised sample is available in the manual. Financial aid reported for each of the five terms. We have summer one, fall, winter, spring, summer two, and then clock hour schools may have awards for all five terms. If you're summer one, that's usually considered the header, and summer two tends to be trailer. If you're a semester school, you're going to report some uh, semester the winter as a zero rather than any number because they're not there. When sh should you include summer aid in your reporting? Chapter two has detailed information regarding this. Summer aid reported are amounts received based on the 22-23 FAFSA or WASFA. In general, your leader or header schools report summer one, and summer two would be reported as a zero. Trailer schools, conversely, would be reported as summer two, and summer one would be reported as zero. Clock hour schools may report aid for both summer terms. If a recipient enrolled in more than one term in the same summer, we want you to report that total amount received and enrollment status as one enrollment term. So if you have a mini, summer one and a summer two, we want you to combine those for one larger term. Fields also to report for 22-23 FAFSA and WASFA filers, the ICER transaction, a rejected ICER WASFA, if marital status, are they dependent, family size, number in college, family income, expected family contribution, cost of attendance, need duration, and need amount. Standard reporting fields. We're gonna talk now about notes, select, special notes for selected fields. The social security numbers uh, are, that's how we identify. That's our, the comparison that we are able to make. Duplicates are not accepted. Files containing duplicate SSNs will not upload. The SSNs have to match between the unit record and Seesaw or the obligation tracker records. If you discover any of these discrepancies, you're going to need to contact us to correct the links to ensure the data or history is correct. You'll primarily be working with Ann to resolve these issues. Invalid SSN sequences are flagged. Don't use dummy numbers like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all nines, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. They need to be valid SSNs. 
the SSNs of WCG, CBS, and Passport to College recipients will be compared to WASAC Seesaw records. And the SSNs of recipients of other WASAC applications, Teacher, WAVE, National Guard, will be compared to WASAC records. Discrepancies will show on error reports. Guidance for resolution of SSN issues are included in the unit record manual, and it's very detailed. This is basically the translation for the year in school table. Uh, report the status of the beginning of the term of the recipient's last financial aid disbursement for the 22-23 year. You may need to read that again. Do not automatically use the year in school reported on the FAFSA or WASFA. Students have a very difficult time when they fill this out. If they fill it out and they're still a sophomore, but by the end of the year, they're going to be junior, we want them to report junior, not sophomore. So I know it can be confusing to them. So make sure that you validate that against your records. Report the highest year in school for which the student attended when the financial aid was dispersed. Code 8 or other is used to report need-based aid for Running Start students or other students who have not yet graduated from high school or matriculated. Family information, if they're uh, generally, it's reported from the FAFSA or WASFA. It is continuing in 22-23. It needs to be two or higher for dependent students and must be one or higher for independent students. If they're married, it must be two or higher. Number in college for 22-23 is still out there, so it must be one or higher. It can't exceed the family size. Parents' enrollment should not be included unless you made a professional judgment decision. And they should all align across unit records, Seesaw, and the FAFSA and WASPA. Family income, report the family income, taxable and untaxed, based on a review of the 22-23 FAFSA or WASPA. Generally, you'll be using the 2020 income from the FAFSA or WASPA. And as I've stated before, if a professional judgment decision was made, report that income but make sure that you submit those changes through the federal processor or the WASFA so that the seesaw record is updated. Report integers without dollar signs or cents. And this is the only place where negative numbers can be used. Report the expected family contribution. We want you to use the federal methodology calculation that's produced by the U.S. Department of Education based on the 22-23 FAFSA or the WASFA EFC. Even if you use a different FC, we want in like institutional methodology that some private schools may use, we want you to use the expected family contribution. Of course, the EFC may be adjusted by professional judgment decisions. The information should reflect the number of months reported in need duration. Uh, we'll talk more about this as we go along. Cost of attendance. Most campuses use several budgets to reflect changes in living expenses. And this year on the uh, for the PPA, we ask for student budgets. Um, we're getting more and more questions about actual costs overall for students rather than just tuition and fees. So thank you for providing that information this year. Report the student budget amount related to the need amount. It should be based on the number of months reported in the duration. So your COA, need duration, and EFC must align for the same number of months. If you report nine months, the duration needs to be nine months, the cost of attendance needs to be nine months, and the FC needs to be nine months. This is the standard calculation that's used, you all. This is in your brains, I'm sure. 
uh, base all three items on the number of months reported in the need duration. For need amount, report the amount used in the disbursement of May of aid. Report your need amount as zero or higher. If you have a negative need amount, change it to zero. That's what we don't have aid currently based on any negative values. So if you run across those, it'd be great if you change that to zero because if you don't, I have to. And it just, you know, takes more time. But if you are not able to do that, that's fine. Report your need duration based on the number of months for which the need amount and cost of attendance were reported. Normally, you're going to report the need duration from 1 to 12. If you use a nine-month budget set up and the student leaves after one term, you're not required to recalculate everything to three-month duration. You don't have to. Uh, it's not required. But if you do, you need to change them all. So if you change one element, they all need to match. It needs to be consistent for the same time period as what's required. If the enrollment does not match need duration, which is one of those new informational errors, it will affect those records where the student attrition has taken place. That's another reason uh, where there could be a true mismatch where the student attended or received aid longer than reflected in need duration, and it needs to be corrected. So be aware of that. This is a translation table for term enrollment status. This is uh, pretty standard. Um, keep in mind that career schools for every 300 hours of attendance, that's full time. An exception can be made for the final term. And also clock hours could have five terms to report. Stephanie? And within CTU ceiling for term enrollment status, the enrollment statuses are pulled from the SA load field on the SA term page. SA term values are translated and included in the CSD data file. We have S for full time, T for three quarter time, H for half time, L for less than half time, and N for not enrolled. For Washington College Grant, College Bound Scholarship, Passport to College, and the WCG Bridge Grant, report the final awards and enrollment levels of the student at the time of disbursement. The unit record reporting tool will check against Seesaw records. Review the WCG, CBS, and Passport Differences report to verify all recipients and that awards are correctly reported and usually reviews how to respond to your edits. For the reporting of tuition waiver dollars for WCG and CBS recipients, it's required for 22-23 as it was last year. We're looking for an accurate representation of all forms of assistance that needy students are receiving. So we want you to include the full assessed tuition and fee amounts in each student's cost of attendance to reflect tuition prior to the application of waivers. What are your what are the student's actual tuition and fee costs? Report the waivers as a financial aid resource in the appropriate field, either need-based institutional gift aid or non-need-based institutional gift aid. For state work study, report on-campus and off-campus employment separately. Report the student's total gross earnings, including employer match or institutional share. We want you to include summer employment. Report either the actual gross earnings based on monthly cutoff dates or institutional payroll dates, or average gross term earnings over the academic year for all terms a student was enrolled at least half time. The state work study staff review this section of the unit record for accuracy and may contact the school if there's a substantial difference between reporting 
and year-end recon records on file with state work study. So the total amount needs to be very close to what was reported in the final recon to the state work study staff. Report institutional gift aid as, as either need-based institutional gift aid, and that would be those funds where 22-23 FAFSA or WASFA is required for awarding it, or non-need-based institutional gift aid, and those are all institutional grants, scholarships, or waivers that are awarded without regard to the FAFSA or WASFA. And that would include institutional funds awarded to Running Start or non-matriculated students. This is a list of other state-funded gift assistance. Just some examples that we see over time. So be aware of those. And now we're gonna talk about edits. So as you know, edits help ensure data quality. Uh, it flags certain information that needs some attention. And it may or may not need attention if the data is right. The unit record is utilizing inform informational edits beginning in 22-23. And Appendix C lists all the edit errors and what action needs to take place. Particularly important are those errors that prevent file upload. You need to refer to Appendix C in the manual. And here are just some examples that prevent upload. Your header row is missing or invalid. You have duplicate SSNs. There are invalid codes, or blanks are reported in required fields. Rejected ICE or WASPA is a required field. So if you have a rejected ICE, um, ICE or WASPA, you need to denote that. Make sure you re re review all 12 items in that appendix. Errors that must be fixed, they're non-overridable. Examples are non-resident with WCG or other state aid. Number in college is greater than family size. No valid institutional state work study allocation in the portal. If the file upload worked, but then the secondary edits run, these will require you to correct the student record before you can submit. Examples of overridable errors, again, refer to Appendix C appropriate pages. Need amount is zero with need-based aid. So an example here is your budget changed with dropped credits. The year in school for type of aid, this happens frequently because students change status from undergrad to grad um, mid-year. And so you're going to get an error. If that's correct, then you just say, you update that, override that error. Cost of attendance minus expected family contribution, contribution calculated by the edit program does not equal need amount reported by the college. And then this, the date of birth outside the normal range is now an informational message only. We would encourage you to look at these to make sure that they are indeed okay. All right, yesterday I sent an email to the listserv with some updates in relation to some of the WASAC changes that are occurring. And in one instance regarding URR, I stated that you can run the existing unit record process to begin your cleanup work. Just don't load it to the WASAC portal. And the purpose of that is to generate these edit reports. And it's recommended that the reports be reviewed and worked in the order shown here to verify that setups and errors are addressed prior to reviewing data to be included in the UR extract file. And so the first report is the missing item type report. And this report will identify any FA item type that has been awarded to a student with an amount greater than zero and qualifies to be reported in the unit record report extract file 
Thus, the item type doesn't exist in the unit record report configuration setup page. The next report that's generated is report B, which is an error detail and summary report. This report is separated into two sections. The first tab contains a list of students sorted by last name, first name, and the ID who have one or more errors, and the error message number and description are included. The second tab contains a list of all error messages encountered on the first tab with a student total count for each. And to resolve those errors, you'll want to refer to Appendix C in the CTC link URR doc for suggestions on how those can be resolved. And then our final edit report is Report A, which is a student detailed report. And this report provides a list of student details to be included in the extract file. In addition, the dollar amount for each award received by the student is tallied and provided in the total column. Just some reminders, we've talked about quite a lot of information. So we want you to keep override comments brief, but we need sufficient details so that we, so you are, we actually know what your explanation is in the edit response. Report family income using the WCG income calculation, not federal total income field from the FAFSA without appropriate adjustments. Income reported in Seesaw for 22-23 should reflect the WCG income calculation. The information is in the WCG 23-24 manual or yeah, and in uh, the unit record manual. So pay attention to what we are looking for. The ISER WASFA transaction number reported should be the most recent used to award the student. It's not necessarily the last one filed. This is used to compare the FAFSA WASFA to the unit record and to Seesaw for discrepancies related to family income, family size, number in college, or expected family contribution. The comparison now appears in the on file tab in the unit record student record. Report an adjusted expected family contribution according to need duration if a student attended less than full time full year if it's your standard practice to do so. If one element is adjusted, you must adjust all. EFC need, COA, and need duration must all be consistently aligned. Report all known race categories for each student, even where Hispanic origin is marked Y. This eliminates gaps in research data. And some reminders for CTC link unit record reporting. The basic steps are to reconcile your award Add or update your institutional unit record report configuration tables. Run the unit record report, and this can be run as many times as needed. Each time a new CSV data file is generated, review your report and correct errors. Rerun the unit record report once you've corrected all of your errors and you're ready to load it to FlawFact. You'll download your CSV data file to your desktop or local network drive, and then you'll upload that CSV file to the WASAC portal. So for tips and best practices, upload your CSV file early. Don't wait for the deadline. If you have trouble, contact Ann or me so that we can help you. Uh, for a number of you, it's going to be new as it was. This 3.0 is new for us. Last year was our first year. But if you need help, contact us. Review WASAC's 22-23 unit record manual and training materials. And test upload using the portal training environments. And the training site is portaltraining.wasac.wa.gov. 
keep in mind that the information you enter, if, it, if you enter it today, it will be gone tomorrow. So you need to complete your testing in the portal training in the same day. Use unit record informational reports to check for consistency and validity. CTCs, review the SBCTC 2223 unit record processing guide when it's available. And again, contact WASAC with questions or issues that aren't addressed in WASAC's unit record manual. I, I think it's pretty comprehensive, but there may be things that are not clear or aren't in there that there should be. We will send notices to attendees when the, this session has been posted to the web and is available for, for you to share with others. Do you have any final questions before moving to the portal application? I didn't see any questions. Um, I don't see any questions either, Marla. Okay. We are now on to Anne. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let us move forward. This first slide, I think most of you are familiar with. Uh, our uh, direct URL is shown in the banner across the top. It is portal uh, https colon forward slash forward slash portal dot wasac dot wa dot gov and then forward slash. There is a, a way to get to this page from our main website, uh, and that is to go to the administration tab along the top of the WASAC main uh, website. And uh, under administration, there is a direct link to the portal. If you uh, click on that, it will drop down a list, and the very first item is the portal. It will take you to this page. And there are two ways to enter this, uh, either by uh, clicking this unit record report uh, button down here, which will take you directly to the welcome page on the unit record report. Or if you use the general login, it will take you to uh, the main uh, menus, uh, and then you can select the unit record report um, from that page. This is a copy of the uh, main menu page. If you click on programs, it will drop down a list of the programs for which you have authorization to work. And the unit record is one of those. If you do not see unit record on your list of authorized programs, um, please reach out to your institutional um, portal administrator who should be able to give you access to that through the administration um, tab. Uh, if they're unfamiliar with how to do that, um, please reach out to us and then we will work with them to get that authorization for you. Once you've entered the unit record, the welcome screen will pop up and uh, it looks, um, the same as it did last year, but you'll notice that um, we have this navigation bar, which is an improvement from the, the prior unit record a couple of years ago. And as you complete each step, it will um, turn color and allow you to move forward. Um, also, I made a note here uh, because I think it's important for, uh, for you to know is that uh, one of the changes with the 3.0 uh, unit record is that uh, when you upload a file, if you have left out a record for a student that has award information in our uh, portal or in the obligation tracker, uh, it will auto load and create a blank record for that student other than uh, I think it's the name and the uh, social security number are placed there, but the rest of it shows up as a blank record for you to, to complete. So don't be surprised if um, when you upload your file, you show up with um, maybe a few extra records, because that is the indicator that um, something has been omitted from your unit record that we have on file here. 
I also want to point out that if you need a copy of the CSV um, header file, you can download a copy here uh, by clicking that little blue um, word here. Um, generally, you just click this browse and choose your file from your own directory. And as soon as you've loaded a file in there, click the uh, start upload button. Or if you are creating records manually, you can uh, click this uh, create records manually um, there. I do want to give you a warning. If you create one record, it will then auto load all the rest of your other files in there that are blank, uh, which may not be what you want since you will have to manually complete each and every one of those. After a successful upload, you'll have um, an indicator right up front. Uh, it will tell you that it's a successful upload with a green check mark. So then um, you would click the continue button, which will then take you next to the errors page. If you have critical errors that cause your upload to fail, you will get a pink box that uh, provides you with information about what row and what field uh, is one of your, pro your problem areas. Um, it can get pretty lengthy um, and uh, you can download a copy of those errors that will allow you to identify uh, more easily as you're going back through that um, upload report to um, correct those before you reattempt uh, an upload with this try again. The try again button will clear out the data that you uploaded um, that you attempted to upload and allow you to um, start from scratch. I um, am providing here just a quick overview of the types of errors uh, that can uh, occur in the unit record. The first is the critical errors, and those are the ones that prevent your file from uploading. Those errors absolutely have to be corrected in your upload file before you reattempt to uh, load the revised file. Next are the must fixes. Uh, these are non overwritable errors uh, that are revealed after you have a successful file upload. You must make the change in the record and save it before you can move forward to complete your unit record submission. The overwritable errors are errors that require uh, some type of a correction or an override explanation to be entered into the student record if you believe your data is correct and want to provide some background information. Uh, we ask that those override comments, uh, as Marla said, be brief, but please be sure that the comment you leave in there actually relates to the actual error itself. Um, sometimes we get a cryptic uh, explanation and it doesn't truly answer the error that has been placed on that record. And then we will reach out to you to get a, 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 a more clear explanation. The uh, fourth category is the informational errors. And these um, are errors that may or may not require a correction. Uh, in order to ensure your um, reporting is accurate. Um, you must review the record to determine if, number one, a correction is required, or if um, you can enter an override comment that will clarify the situation. Uh, in some occasions, you may find that uh, you want to enter what we call a note. There is an area in the unit record to do that. The notes are not connected to a specific uh, student record, but they are general comments that might apply to um, a broader uh, overview of something that you see occurring in your unit record that you feel needs some explanation. If you place that in the note um, and we see that after you've submitted the unit record, sometimes that will prevent us from having to make a call to you because you've provided an explanation up front. 
for a situation that may not be um, apparent or um, that looks to us might need some additional information. Um, or uh, the third option is that uh, some records can be left without um, a comment. Um, that may occasionally happen. Uh, and that's kind of left up to you, although we do look at those uh, informational um, errors that don't have a comment and review that record to see if it's apparent to us that um, everything is, is copacetic, that you know, there isn't something that requires more transparency. We do review those and we um, will reach out to you if we have additional questions. <clears throat> Once you have um, moved forward from your um, upload screen, you will see the uh, main error screen and it will list all of your errors of all types you can sort this according to the header rows on that um, that screen. You can uh, increase or decrease the number of records that you see on each page. You see here there's a drop down. I believe the options are like 5, 10, 50, 100, 1,000. So um, you can cause your screen to elongate or shorten it up uh, to make it easier for you to review. You also can move from page to page, or you can choose to review uh, your errors by status. Um, and these would be um, things like, um, you know, must fix, informational, um, overridable, overridden, um, so that you can take a look at this, you know, in whatever fashion you want. And you can also select your review by error type. And um, you see here, um, this is the status types. Here are whatever errors you have within your unit record will be listed in this particular dropdown. In order to open a unit record and um, review it, uh, click on the highlighted social security number, it should be in light blue. Once you're in the uh, student record, you'll see that there are four tabs uh, that you can navigate through that student record. Uh, you'll initially land on this errors page and it will list for you all of the errors for that student. Uh, you can uh, download the results to a CSV just as you can from that main error page. Um, You'll notice that the social security number has no click function because you're already in the student record. There's really nowhere else for you to go while you're in there other than to click on whatever tab you want to work in. Um, in order to um, make uh, an override comment after you've reviewed the details, terms, and on file tab, you would click the little box in front of the social security number and that will activate this box for the override reason where you can enter your comment and then click override errors. Um, if you want to delete that error, you can click that same box, go back and click the gray delete overrides and it should delete that override and you can start over. There is uh, another way that you can address those, and I'll show you that in a few minutes. But uh, please ensure that before you leave that record that you have clicked that blue save button. Here's a copy of the student detail tab, and uh, it uh, mimics what I think you would have seen a couple of years ago in the demographics tab. It has all of the student information, their ethnicity, their ICER uh, WASFA information that you're reporting to us, their student budget, and their family information. If you have uh, any changes that need to be made in any of those fields, you edit directly into this, the field itself. Here's a view of the terms tab. And in this tab, 
it will reflect all of the uh, state aid programs that you have uh, reported for that student, the terms and uh, you know the um, disbursement of those funds by term. And uh, if you find that there is um, a program that is not shown there for which you'd like to report information, you can unlock this view. This currently is unlocked or locked. Uh, you see the little icon here, but you unlock it first and then click the show all and the entire list of programs that are reported on the unit record will drop down and then you can enter that new information in whatever fields uh, you need to uh, edit. Be sure that if you're editing it and placing information in a term that shows as not enrolled, that you correct that because that will also generate another uh, error if it shows not enrolled and there are funds reported in, in a program. Once again, be sure that you click that save button. Now the on file tab I think is very useful in that it will show you a comparison of what is in our seesaw. And if there are programs down in this area, uh, those would be coming from the uh, obligation tracker or the program record itself in uh, in our portal. So it is a comparison of what you have reported in Seesaw or in um, any of the program records with what you are reporting in the unit record. And if the student has a FAFSA or WASFA, that information should show here in this third row. Anything that has a check mark uh, agrees with our records. If there is a red mark, a red X, that means uh, there is a discrepancy, okay? Now, this EFC may or may not spring an actual um, error uh, because if you report, this, the unit record recognizes if you have reported a need duration of less than nine months, it will accept a lower EFC in your unit record than what is shown in the FAFSA or WASFA. So that is something that we built in. But if you are showing a nine month um, need duration, this will be matched against the ICE or WASFA and it will generate an error uh, that you will see in this errors list if they do not match. Here, the... Um, ICER WASFA obviously does not match what you placed in unit record or in Seesaw. And there may be reasons for this. The ICER WASFA has a formula that looks at income. However, there are certain pieces of income that not all schools use to adjust that family income. And so uh, you may find that this doesn't match what is in Seesaw. You need to look at that, your ICER WASFA information carefully. Um, because if if this is accurate, we will accept it, but you may have to place an override donation in the unit record. If this is correct, however, then we would expect that you would reflect that in your unit record, and your override comment would ask us to adjust this program data in the um, Seesaw. You need to be careful of that, because if this is now increased, it may put into question the amounts that were dispersed for your other programs. So uh, be sure when you report that you're reporting accurately. As mentioned, uh, you can enter your overrides from this student record uh, by clicking uh, the a uh, little box in front of the social number for that specific error, which will activate this override reason, and then click the override. Um, what you'll see is this red overridable um, text will turn green and it will say overridden. Be sure that you click save before you exit that record. <clears throat> As noted, um, these errors can also be overridden from the main error screen. 
which is this return to list, which is the main institutional error stream. Once you've entered an override reason, you can quickly uh, review by hovering your cursor over that green uh, overridable text, and uh, it will pop up your uh, error message as a little pop-up box. If you want to see it as part of your um, error uh, table, then you would click on overridden and it will drop it down just below the actual error itself. Uh, I want you to make note here of this little pencil icon. Um, if you are the same person who entered that initial override reason, you are now able to edit that rather than delete and start over by clicking on this pencil. And uh, so as I mentioned, uh, the override comments can be edited by the original writer. Otherwise, if you are another, another staff member from the school, you will have to um, create a new override explanation. Um, so uh, just so that you're aware of that. Um, and as I mentioned, you click, click the green overridden uh, text to expose that little pencil icon. If you're the original writer of that, you can edit it rather than um, delete and override and with a new error message, uh, and then make sure that you click save. If you're trying to um, delete it, you can click the, the gray override. And um, I believe we are now retaining that information in history, uh, but it will allow you to um, flag that as deleted. If you have social security number differences, um, how that would be uh, corrected does depend on where the um, original error uh, took place. If the error is actually in the unit record record, um, you can open that student's record and edit directly in that details page to correct it. If, however, the incorrect social security number originates, say, in Seesaw or in the obligation tracker, perhaps it was reported to us incorrectly at the beginning of the year, um, you will need to reach out to WASAC for assistance. Uh, there is um, a send us an email uh, button right above your navigation bar. Uh, and you would click that and provide us with the details that are needed uh, to allow us to identify which is the correct social security number and which is the incorrect number, as well as um, the student's you know, name and other information that might be pertinent. On the other hand, uh, as I said, if you have a note that you wanna add um, to the unit record, that is not a specific to a student, but more generally to your um, report altogether. Uh, there is also an add a note icon uh, that you can click right there, just above the navigation bar. And now I'd like to talk a little bit about the bulk override processing. This is a new feature that we um, uh, added to the unit record last year. And I want to ask that you be judicious in how you apply these bulk overrides. The first step is to review all the records uh, to determine whether a correction is required or, or whether a bulk override comment could be applied to um, several records at once. And the reason for that is sometimes the same error message may be generated, but when you look at that student record, um, a generic reply doesn't always apply. <laughs> I, um, in reviewing these records last year, I do check these, and I found often um, that uh, what applied to 
several students over here did not fit the situation for um, a good number of other students. And so I would then uh, reject that and then go back to you and ask you uh, to revisit that record. So um, we don't mind if you use bulk overrides where, um, where it is applicable to a number of the same records um, errors, but be sure that it actually applies to each and individual student that you include in that bulk override. And in order to uh, process those from the main institution uh, errors page, you can um, select the type of error message that you want to review for and um, just select that. It will sort this uh, errors screen in order to show you only those errors. In this case, you know, cost of attendance minus EFC does not equal mean. So um, after you reviewed them, you would then click on the little uh, boxes next to each of the records for whom you um, have decided that override reason will apply uh, and then move up to uh, the override field. You'll notice here I've clicked seven and it says override seven errors. So it does keep track of how many you're putting in there. And then once you have entered your override, click the blue override errors box and it will apply it to all of the records. Uh, the same is true in, in reverse. You can um, click on whichever um, errors need to be uh, reversed and then click the gray delete overrides. And it will also place in there how many overrides you are deleting. And that makes these overridable again, rather than overridden. Um, and then you can address them. In this particular instance, I clicked this little blue box next to the social security um, header. And that selected everything that was on this page or actually everything that's within this category. Um, you would not click that box if you are not selecting all of them. You could um, select them individually in order to, to um, produce that bulk override. If you are trying to search for a record um, that you need to edit and you're not seeing it uh, right away on that error screen, or perhaps it didn't generate an error, but you decided that something needs to be updated in that record, um, navigate back to that upload button. And there is a search students button there. And that will open up the search screen where you can either upload a comma separated file with uh, social security numbers, or you can search individually by any field. So if you're looking for everyone who reported a family income of say 36,000, you can put 36,000 there and it will bring up um, everyone who has that. And it actually may actually, you know, bring up these categories too, um, because this is a little less um, focused, um, unless it's just a, a name that you're putting in there, a last name or a social security number. But you can you can upload uh, a file with multiple comma separated social security numbers and still uh, come up with the um, search records. In order to edit that record, you would click on that student's social security number from that search page, and then you can uh, edit whatever part of that record um, needs to be edited. Uh, if you're trying to delete that record, you can do so from here. Um, on the other hand, uh, please be aware that if that student has an award in our uh, Seesaw or our other portal records, 
it will not delete that record in full. What it does is it will delete all the information except the name of the student and the social security number. And it will retain that as if it's a new error with, I think it's five different errors. So be careful when you are trying to delete a record to make sure that there isn't anything in this terms or on file that belongs to um, one of the awards dispersed from WASAC. Um, as I said, you can click save in order to, to change or to keep any of the edits that you've made. Now, if you click return to list, I believe it will uh, take you back to the search screen. If you are manually adding a student record after you have uploaded a file, there are two places that you can do so. Uh, from this error screen, there is a button for add record. Or if you go back to this upload um, screen, there is a button for add record there as well. Either one works, so uh, it's your choice which you prefer to use. Um, as you see here, this is a blank record, both tabs, details, and terms. Once you have completed these in full, uh, click the Save button at the top in order to retain that record. Once you have added a record manually, usually you will get some immediate feedback whether there are some errors in that record. Um, if that's the case, then you're in the record, you can uh, make your corrections and then uh, save and then go back to the report, which is the main edit screen. I would ask that you click the revalidate button before you leave that um, main error screen, before you click that continue to review, because <clears throat> occasionally there are errors that are um, what I call hidden. They uh, aren't apparent uh, on first view. So uh, if you click that revalidate, it will reprocess your errors and it will throw them into that um, main edit screen for you to correct. Um, and then uh, after you've corrected those, uh, the continue to review button will appear. To manually delete the student records, as I mentioned, you can find and open that student record from the errors or from the search screen and click the delete. And then it will ask you to confirm the delete. As I mentioned, if it turns out that that happens to be a record uh, which um, has some award data in our um, Seesaw or obligation tracker, uh, it will retain that record and ask you to um, provide us with either an override comment of some sort, which in many cases may be if, if you're deleting that record, it means that that student did not receive the, the state funds. And uh, we would expect to see in that override comment that you are uh, returning those funds to WASAC. And um, then we would add that to our pending refunds list and um, monitor for that return thereafter. One of the other new functions uh, from last year is the supplemental file upload. And uh, this is um, a way in which uh, you can add or delete records or make changes, um, you know, edits to multiple records in one file. And it would be uploaded as a, a supplemental to the original upload file that you have already uh, placed in the unit record. Uh, you can do several different types of changes all in that same supplemental file. You do need to use a valid CSV header as the top row and uh, include the complete student record information in each row. 
uh, and I will uh, talk a little bit about um, how to generate that or how to get that full row of information um, for those that are uh, existing records in the unit record um, a little bit later. If you're editing existing records, make sure that you retain that full data in, for that student and edit only the fields that need change. If you delete information from that um, student's row in the supplemental file, it overwrites existing data for those affected students, which means that um, it will generate new errors. So you, you need to be sure that you include complete information. Um, once you've uploaded a supplemental file and it successfully uploads, you can't go back and uh, reverse that. In other words, you can't discard that. That information has already been integrated into the unit record and you would have to edit any um, errors from the search or the error screen or you would have to upload a compensating supplemental file that reverses all the information that you put in. If you have a, an un unsuccessful supplemental file uh, upload, <clears throat> you uh, will see a delete upload and a try again feature. So in, in that particular instance, since it was unsuccessful, it never made it fully into the unit record and it will just delete um, the information that was attempted and then allow you to try that again. Here's um, a cutaway example of the first few fields of um, a supplemental uh, file. As I mentioned, um, you use the same CSV header for these. So as you know, there are many, many, many fields um, and so this is just a, a small cutout uh, that highlights this is delete um, field. And if it says true or yes, it will delete whatever record you have in, in that um, row. Unless, of course, it is something that has an existing, pre existing award in Seesaw or Obligation Tracker. In that case, it will delete the information but leave you with a blank record retaining the student name and social number. If, if you place a false in there or a no or an N, what that means, it signals that there is an edit or two in that student record that you are trying to um, make a change in the, the actual unit record. So it will not delete that student. It will just make whatever changes you are uh, attempting to incorporate. After you've created the supplemental file, navigate to the upload screen. And there is a button that says add file. And from that point, you would just follow the same steps you do uh, to upload your original file. Once you click that, it will bring you this add new file screen. You navigate to uh, your um, laptop or PC, select your um, file, and then click start upload. And if it's successful, it will show you the successfully uploaded message and it will ask you to continue on to the errors screen. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, how to create that supplemental file um, in a few more slides. So please don't think I've overlooked that. Um, I have that information a little bit further down the road. Um, Explanatory notes uh, can be added to um, the unit record for WASAC staff to view. Uh, as I mentioned, it should be uh, a button right above your navigation bar. And uh, when you click that, it will give you an open field that you can uh, place a message and then save note. 
the um, um, this is um, probably better than trying to send us a regular email because within the unit record, it's still in the secure portal. So this comes to us with your unit record. So it, it never goes outside of that secure um, location, that secure site. And so um, if there's something uh, that you need to tell us uh, about your, your file or about a specific student, you can place it here. Um, generally speaking, if you're talking about a specific student, um, it makes sense to put it in the override comment. Uh, but uh, this is available if your student doesn't have an error, but you need to provide us with information about that student. Uh, as with the um, override comments, uh, many different notes can be added. They all come to us um, when you submit your unit record, and uh, the notes are editable by that original writer. After you have addressed all errors and your edits are complete, um, the continue to review button should appear. That's your clue that you have um, no errors so long as uh, the revalidation process doesn't uh, pop any new ones in. And that will take you to the preliminary program totals report. We ask that um, you look at this. It has a comparison of the last four years. In this particular case, um, we're talking about um, a, a dummy institution. So there is no historical information and all you'll see is, in this particular case, it says 21, 22, but it will show 22, 23 um, for this year. And um, if there are any changes between this year and this year, it will throw those percentage changes here in this final column. If there is any information that um, strikes you as odd, um, you can contact us to discuss it. Um, and it may uh, require some editing of your student records if there's a major issue, but we don't tend to find that very often. Um, but one of the things we do ask is that you download a copy of this in PDF format uh, for comparison. Um, this particular uh, report, as I said, is uh, preliminary, which means that it contains some additional information that uh, once the unit record has been closed and finalized, we will remove um, those records that have not one dollar of need-based aid. And so you may find some changes um, in January when we post the final report. And you will want to have this as a comparison. Perhaps it, it will um, not only give you some good information, but um, next year when we're uh, reviewing uh, and looking at this program totals report, you're gonna want to compare apples to apples, which is preliminary program totals report to preliminary to program totals report. Um, but having that comparison at the, at the year end after finalizing also gives you a good sense of whether uh, some of the questions that might be asked about this are answered by realizing it has to do with those um, additional uh, records that are, are stripped from the unit record at year end. If you agree with everything you see here, click confirm report. It will also ask you um, to continue to submit. So there is two steps to that confirmation process. Before you are able to submit, um, you will need to review the program uh, differences reports here, the WCG, CBS, and Passport reports to ensure that there, there are no other unresolved differences. Um, and each program is a separate report. You'll see here 
if you click this, it will take you to a page where you select the program, and then you can review each of those programs as a separate um, as a separate item. Any differences uh, must be addressed and accounted for. Um, here is an example of a differences report for WCG. Um, and if you see a no or a blank under this overridden column, that is a trigger to go back and take a look at that student record. Um, a yes means that you've already looked at it and addressed it. It may mean uh, that um, that funds might be returned to the WASAC, uh, depending on your override comment. So um, because here the SSNs are not highlighted, you would take a look at um, what's in your unit record versus your um, Seesaw records by clicking on these highlighted um, items. Once you've reviewed all of those, you would click the return to report summary. And um, as I mentioned, if there are significant differences uh, that you don't address through um, this differences report, uh, we will reach out to you for with questions. Um, but generally speaking, if, if you've addressed them here, um, we, we don't generally find too many errors unless um, you're giving us a reason for something that that uh, doesn't make sense from our, our side. But um, once you've gone back to that report summary, click on this, I've reviewed the report. And it will then uh, cause the submit button to pop up. This is a navigation bar and clicking on that will not initiate a submit. So just so you know the difference, um, this blue submit button, if you click it, it will pop up with uh, a request that you confirm that you're uh, absolutely certain that uh, you're ready to submit. Um, because if once you've confirmed, uh, you are not able to go back into the unit record and make additional changes without um, WASAC reverting your file. So if you've confirmed, you should get a successfully submitted um, message. In between here and here, you will see that the unit record report is reprocessing your errors. So if you <clears throat> failed to do that revalidation step earlier, it will do it here. And um, if it finds some errors, it will let you know that you need to go back to this step. This particular uh, point in time um, data file download is um, something we highly encourage you to do at the time that you submit your unit record. Um, if you go back to this upload uh, navigation, there is a download report button. And that report will give you a full copy of your unit record report, including all of the corrections and um, edits that you have placed in it. It does not give you a copy of your error messages uh, or your override comments. That's that particular um, report you would want to download while you're still in the error screen. Um, but this will give you uh, a copy of the um, unit record report as it exists at the time you download. Okay. Uh, we recommend that you keep that for your historical records. And, um, you know, it may also be useful for creating that supplemental file upload because you can you can download this report at any point while you are working on your errors. It will give you a point in time download of the information you have in your data file. 
So if you need to create that supplemental file, you may want to download this report. Find those rows of uh, individuals for whom you want to make an edit. Create your supplemental file from that and then make the changes directly in that supplemental file before you save and upload it. So um, this can be very handy at several different points uh, during your work with the unit record. Um, and we do uh, encourage you to keep a copy um, because if you, know, you need at some point to go back and start over, which we don't generally suggest, there is a button here for delete all unit record data. That removes everything. Uh, it does leave us with some historical information that when you upload your new file, it will um, retain the history for your overrides. Um, so those will appear in that new upload. But um, I highly suggest that that be kept. Uh, let me see here. Okay. Um, after you have submitted your unit record report, uh, you will find that um, there are several reports here. The demographic distribution report, this preliminary totals report, and your um, passport um, CBS and WCG differences reports. These are all downloadable to you immediately. Um, and as I said, this is a preliminary version of your program totals report. Um, the other thing that you may not have been aware of is that you can go back up to three years prior to the current unit record and download those reports from this dropdown on this submit page. So, um, those are also available to you until they drop off um, this download list. Um, so I just wanna be sure that you are aware of that. Profile reports button, you'll notice at this time is grayed out. And the reason for that is until we close and finalize all of the unit records in January, uh, the profile reports are not available until that time. And um, these are the four reports that you will find in your profile reports. When they're available, um, you will find that Marla will send you a, a notice, an announcement uh, that you can come back to this um, submit page for your unit record and download these profile reports. I think at that, I believe we are done with our main presentation. Um, I'd like to see if there are any uh, questions. I don't see any in the Q and A. Um, Marla, uh, is this a good time for us to um, unmute folks? Uh, if if you will. Um, raise your hand or put in an, uh, a, a question in the Q&A that um, we can see that you're raising your hand. Uh, we'd be more than happy to unmute you at this point before we conclude our, our process here. I know that was a lot of information in the unit record coverage. Uh, I am hoping uh, to also do um, a tutorial video that uh, we'll post to the um, agency uh, unit record website. And if folks need uh, additional assistance, um, I would be open to uh, doing a live tutorial with uh, anyone who feels they need that. Uh, I'm hoping that we would do uh, a small group uh, if that's the case, but I'm hoping that uh, the tutorial recording will be um, helpful uh, for those of you who may need some additional assistance. So um, is there anyone who'd like to um, ask a question live online? Here's one. 
Right. Maybe. This one is for um, <clears throat> Stephanie. Are you able to see it, Stephanie? Or would you like me to uh, no. speak it out? Why don't you speak it out? Okay. It says, so we are not uploading anything until we are told to. I thought Stephanie said something about not doing anything until with uploading until we are told. That's correct. You don't want to upload the CTC link unit record report to the WASAC portal until you hear from me that the new layout is available in production. So you can go ahead and run your report now in production to start working your edit reports, getting your setup updated. The only two areas that you would not be able to update is having a specific category for WAVE as well as WCG Bridge, because those are the two new fields that will be going into production. Um, I do have two colleges that I've reached out to, and they've graciously agreed to test this new file layout. So they will be doing their testing over the course of this next week. And then at some point towards the end of next week, I can um, give an update as to where we're at and when that will be available in production. Okay. Are there any other live questions that we can answer for you? Okay. Seeing none, I think uh, we'll move forward with our last couple of slides. All right, and the URR processing guide is now available on the CTC Link Reference Center. It is up to date for this round of 22-23 reporting. And then if you need any assistance with setup or running of the CTC Link unit records report, please submit a ticket via the service desk, and that will be under the unit record report category. And for us, um, we have on screen here our direct contact information, both phone numbers and um, email addresses. We do suggest, however, that um, the, the best um, way to contact us is through unit record at wasac.wa.gov. It is the um, mailbox for the unit record that both Marla and I monitor. So if one of us is not available, usually the other one uh, will see and pick that up and uh, can respond to you right away. We ask that uh, you review the um, unit record manual. It's already available on um, the website that you see uh, there. And uh, the CSV uh, header file uh, example is also available on that page. So um, if you have any questions, the uh, manual is, I think, pretty thorough. Uh, it is um, inclusive of many of the screenshots that you saw here today. And um, if you, you have additional questions, we're more than happy to assist you. Uh, by giving us a call. Uh, generally, um, I would say you call me first uh, at 360-485-1311. Um, but I know if I'm not available or uh, if you prefer to speak to Marla, she also is available in her direct uh, contact information is there as well. Uh, Marla, is there anything else that perhaps we should cover? I just want to let you know that we do have two uh, staff, additional staff, who are going to help us this year with the unit record. So don't be surprised if you get emails from Nisha, who I am certain most of you have know, and with Debbie Jackson, who's uh, working, she's the State Work Study Assistant Director, but um, they both have said they would be willing to help. So we're hoping that with that additional help, we will be able to complete this in a more timely fashion. So if you don't, don't be surprised if towards the end, they'll be coming up to speed in the next few weeks. 
and uh, you may hear from them. So don't be surprised. But outside of that, no, I really appreciate your time. We know this is a lot of information and I wanna reiterate that the unit record manual is really very complete, but don't be afraid to call us if you don't get something or if it if there's just a piece you don't understand. We, th we think the 3.0 is pretty intuitive, but we work with it every day. So uh, if you have issues, you need to let us know. Don't wait to the end. And I'd also like to stay, uh, to thank Stephanie as well for joining us and presenting um, the CT Link, C Link, uh, PeopleSoft information. Uh, we truly appreciate um, our partnership with you in producing this for the community and technical college sector as well. And we did get another question, and I have to say I'm I don't know the answer. Uh, I'll be happy to answer that question. Oh. You can. I was okay. going to say I don't understand what the error twenty seven is. <laughs> <laughs> and this is answered in the CTC link unit record manual. So it says, I see a lot of error 27 WCG exceed term limits. Is this because of rounding? Will all of those need to be an override on URR? Those are not something that needs to be override. That um, term limit is based on non DAS values. So if you take a look at those students, you'll want to ensure are they the lower level or are they BAS students. And then if you'll notice in the CTC link URR manual, it says those students are still included in the file. So it's just a warning, double check your students, ensure that they're at their correct term limit, and they will load in the unit record CSV. All right. Yeah. Glad you knew that one because I didn't. I know. <laughs> I was thinking it looked <laughs> familiar. We truly appreciate your your work with this. <laughs> so anyway, we thank you for your time and uh, have a really great rest of your day. Yes, thank you, and uh, we'll be looking forward to working with you over the next few months. Bye bye.